Welcome, Joy Kaiser. We are so glad to have you here tonight. Um, being an Akron native and an author and also uh, <clears throat> writing a wonderful book about America's other Audubon. So we're going to just jump right into it and have you uh, give us your presentation and then we'll talk a little bit about how you got there and what you did or whatever you didn't cover in your uh, presentation. How about that? My earliest memory involves a bird. I must have been about the age of two, still young enough to be carried by my mother. I lived in Barberton, Ohio in the second story above my father's TV repair shop. And there were no trees and nothing was green. And my mother was carrying me through the parking lot to visit a little girl next door. And I saw a little bush in the vacant lot and there was a brown bird fluttering its wings there. And it was just a startling moment to me. I had no idea that there were animals that lived outside, out, outside the control of the grown-ups. It was just a revelation. And we lived above my father's store until I was six years old. And then we moved to Norton, Ohio, to a house that had two acres. I felt as if my world had gone from black and white to color because there I saw birds with wings that were gray and black and blue and yellow and green, red and orange. And birds sang every morning when the sun came up and then they would be singing at night when the sun went down. And there were tall oak trees in the front yard and an orchard in the back and the limbs were trimmed so low that I could climb up into them. And I soon discovered there were bird's nests there. I would cautiously climb out to the edge of a branch and look into that little circle of grass. And sometimes I would see the eggs of a sparrow. And then once in a while, I'd see the stunning blue eggs of a robin. And I'd watch the little birds hatch and check on them until they were old enough to fly away. But there was one pair of birds I never could see their nest, and that was Baltimore Orioles that had their nest high above in the trees in the front yard. And I would lay on my back in the, on the grass to look up to, so I didn't strain my neck. And I always wondered what that nest looked like. I had a general idea because I had this guide to the most familiar American birds. And there was an illustration of a nest there. But you can see, it just it really didn't provide any kind of details. Did we lose somebody? We're OK. OK. So many years later, on my first day of work at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, I was stopped dead in my tracks by an illustration in a book that was propped open near the staircase by the stairs that led to the library. There was an Oriole's nest, drawn with such precision that it was photorealistic. And I couldn't help but marvel at the ingenuity of the avian architect and the wonderful skill of the artist. There was a label in the case that said this book was the work of a family that the daughter Genevieve had the idea to create a, nest, a book of nests and eggs and started the work in 1879. Her father paid the publication costs. And the book was issued in parts and after Genevieve died, after just part one was issued, her mother took over completing the artwork and her brother gathered the nests and eggs and the family spent seven years finishing the book in her memory. I thought, what kind of a family devotes seven years of their own lives to finishing someone else's project? And what kind of person must she have been to motivate them to do that? And that, this was Genevieve Jones. And her picture was displayed in the case. And every day when I went to work, I'd look at that face and just wonder what kind of person she was. And that's when I uncovered her story that became America's Other Audubon. Now the father, who was destined to become Genevieve's father, 
Nelson Jones, was born on the Ohio frontier in a cabin that his parents built with their own two hands, and this is a drawing he created from memory. He was a very unhealthy child. In fact, at one point he was even pronounced dead. But then there was no conclusive way to tell if somebody was really dead, so the doctor kept covering him with warm blankets, even while the family planned his funeral. And then he suddenly recovered. So he wanted to become a doctor himself because he was so impressed by the doctors that had helped him get well. He got a late start going to Augusta College in Kentucky when he was already 21. But in less than a year, he had to come back home because he was sick again. He did his best to keep up with his studies by reading in bed. A year later, he and his father visited Dr. David Wills and asked if he would take on a student. And Dr. Wills hemmed and hawed and finally stated, to be frank, your son is well qualified in the preliminaries for the study of medicine, but it's a hard life and I know he'll never be able to stand the rough and tumble. But the purposeful look in Nelson's eyes motivated Dr. Wills to reconsider, and he finally took Nelson on as his pupil. By January of 1845, Nelson had regained enough strength to take the two-day-long canal boat ride and three-day-long stagecoach ride to resume his education in the newly established Cleveland Medical School. Delighted to finally be able to anticipate reaching his goal, Nelson simply stated what he believed to be true. When a Jones makes up his mind to do a thing, you can depend on it. I say that because it's heredity, not meritorious. The school had been established by Dr. Jared Potter Kirtland, who had conducted the first survey of Ohio mammals and reptiles and fishes and mollusks in 1837, and created the first checklist of Ohio birds. Nelson fell under Kirtland's magical influence because of the doctor's willingness to take on any private student who was interested in natural history and provide lessons for free. And with Kirtland's guidance, Nelson built associations with the foremost ornithologists in America that he would maintain for the rest of his life. And while he was in Cleveland, he was befriended by a young chemistry professor, Hamilton L. Smith, a Yale graduate who was also deeply entrenched in Cleveland's scientific community. Hamilton and Nelson became best friends and associated with the members of Cleveland's first scientific society, the Archites, a group of amateurs who met regularly in a two-room building to study their growing collection of animal specimens. The building was nicknamed the Ark, because one new member had remarked that he thought he had just entered Noah's Ark because there were two of every kind. The members of the society were known as the Archites. Nelson thrived on his friendship with Hamilton Smith. Oops, I wasn't sure which way I bumped a key in it. Excuse me. <laughs> Nelson thrived on his friendship with Hamilton Smith, but it did a lot more than satisfy his eager mind. At a party one evening, Nelson's eyes came to rest upon the face of Hamilton's youngest sister, 18-year-old Virginia. Nelson had to remind himself that he wasn't a man of gush, that he did have a level head, and that while he had a warm side and a sentiment for all good girls, equally and alike, no girl had ever stopped his breathing, taken out his brains, or used his heart for a charm or football. And when he looked into the face of Miss Virginia Smith, he found to his extreme discomfort there was an indescribable halo over and around the young lady. It was love at first sight. And fortunately for Nelson, Virginia Smith was equally smitten with him. After he graduated in the spring of 1845, they became engaged. Virginia's father required Nelson to court Virginia for a year under his supervision, and they were married on June 9th in 1846 and moved in with Virginia's parents in Cleveland. Nelson's daughter, Genevieve Estelle, was born on May 13, 1847. Her family and friends always called her Jenny. 
She was a joyful and energetic, inquisitive child who from the very beginning displayed a preference for playing out of doors. When she was just a toddler, Nelson commissioned miniature tow, shovel, and rake from the local blacksmith because Jenny was so determined to work in the yard with the gardener. Jenny's brother Howard was born six years later on August 24th, 1853. In the same year that Nelson moved his young family to Circleville, Ohio to set up his medical practice. Circleville, Ohio was founded in 1810 and derived its name from the shape of the prehistoric American Indian Hopo culture earthwork on which it was built. The streets were arranged in a circular pattern like spokes on a wheel and an octagonal shaped courthouse was in the center as a hub. Situated near the Ohio and Erie Canal and surrounded by wetlands, Circleville was a town that could support the work of several physicians because the standing water was notorious, notorious for causing outbreaks of malaria and typhoid fever. When Jenny was six years old, she began what would be a lifelong practice of riding with her father in his buggy when he went to visit his patients. And along the way, he taught her everything he would learned from Dr. Kirtland about birds. And with the help of their little dog, Arcos, a Cocker Spaniel, who was skilled at flushing birds, they searched for birds' nests and collected eggs to add to the natural history cabinet that they kept in their library. It was on one of these outings that Jenny found an intricate nest her father could not identify. Many years later, they learned it was the nest of a Baltimore Oreo. Jenny asked her father to hurry home so she could look through his books to discover the bird that built the nest, only to be told that there were no books. None had been written about the nests and eggs of American birds. So she remarked that she could hardly believe that no man had thought to create a book to help people differentiate one nest for another. So Howard shared his father's and Jenny's passion for nature and science. As a youth, he maintained a collection of pet hawks, a kingfisher, crows, and owls in his father's barn. And Circleville neighbors were always coming the door to the door to try to sell him birds they'd captured because that's what he spent his allowance on. And when the subject of a book about nests and eggs came up in family conversations, Howard began to suggest that he collect the nests and eggs if Jenny, who loved to paint, would consider illustrating them herself. The Joneses family's library was the most frequently used room in the house and a popular place for spirited discussion among friends from the Circleville community. But Howard reminisced, we derived our greatest pleasure from contact from each other. Jenny and Howard were homeschooled until they were ready to enter high school. Nelson taught them science and history, gardening, horsemanship, hunting, fishing, boating, and woodworking. Virginia taught them penmanship, grammar, music, watercolor painting, and literature. And she was instrumental in helping to establish the first public library. Jenny entered Everett's High School when she was 14 and graduated in 1865. And then her education was continued at home where she was tutored in French and Greek and German and studied music. Her Greek tutor, who had taught at Miami University, considered her the most adept pupil he'd ever had. And her piano teacher eventually refused to keep taking money for lessons because she was a better musician than he was. Howard also entered Everett's High School when he was 14 and described himself as a mediocre and reluctant student. He would have been much happier just to be let alone to wander the woods all day. But everyone concerned, everybody believed that one day he'd have a family of his own and he would have to have an education to support them. So they were determined that he would go away to college. And when he graduated from Hobart, when he graduated from high school, he went to Hobart College in New York in 1871. Jenny followed his college curriculum independently using her father's books. And when he came home to visit, Howard found his sister would 
better than he, he was in his own areas of study. She had mastered chemistry, algebra, and calculus. Jenny was approaching 30 and still unmarried. But she had so little in common with her peers, she must have been, felt isolated and left out. She once wrote, Everyone seems to be leaving town. Sally Gillis goes week after next. Gloria Pritchard expects to be gone ad infinitum. Everyone expects to be having a good time. I intend to stay home and have a good time too, if such a thing can be had in Circleville. Howard later recalled, as I saw it then and remembered it now, there was something lacking in her life that gave a touch of sadness to me at times. And I think our father and mother saw it, but I don't remember that we ever spoke about it. But there was one person outside her immediate family, however, whose intellect seemed perfectly matched with hers. Howard described her suitor, whose name has been lost to history, as a fine-looking gentlemanly fellow who was self-educated, but having traveled much and having a superior intelligence, had required much pleasing yearning. He was 10 years Jenny Sr. and an exceptional musician and a literary critic. But, as Howard described, was that was often the case after the Civil War, the man had a drinking problem. Her father made the two promise not to marry unless the man could stay sober for a year, but he couldn't keep his promise. And so the father, Nelson, felt he had to forbid the two to marry, and Genevieve became despondent. She surely must have shared her bitter disappointment with her childhood friend, her closest friend, Eliza Scholes. Lizzie and Jenny had been best friends since they were little children. Liz Lizzie's parents had come from Pennsylvania. And when uh, Jenny was so depressed, her relatives, her grandparents, invited Virginia to come, invited Jenny to come to Pennsylvania to get over her loss. And while she was there, she visited the Centennial International Exhibition in Philadelphia. And one of the exhibits she probably would have seen, because it drew such attention, was an exhibit by Mrs. M.A. Maxwell, because she had gathered and mounted over 400 mammals, including elk and bison, and 400 birds, the smallest of which was a ruby-throated hummingbird. The reporters remarked that her exhibit was a startling revelation of what a woman could do. And then Jenny saw some of the original hand-colored engravings from Audubon's Birds of America. And she made up her mind she was going to create that book that they'd been talking about. And it was her dr dream to illustrate the nests and eggs of all the species of birds in America, but her father talked her into just starting with the 130 that nested in Circleville. And then if it was successful, she could expand it. So while Jenny and Eliza, her best friend Eliza, began practicing drawing nests, using a pair of calipers to take precise measurements and a magnifying glass to examine details, Nelson researched the procedure for producing a book in those days. He wrote the prospectus. There would be a 100 copies that would be printed, and they, the eggs and nests would be freshly collected so the colors would be at their peak, and they'd be drawn life-size, the way the drawings of the birds had been in Audubon's work. And the illustrations would be colored by hand using imported Windsor Newton watercolors. The book would be sold through subscription and issued in parts. Each part would have three illustrations in the accompanying text, and the colored version would be for five dollars oh. <laughs> and the uncolored version would be for two dollars and once they had 20 subscriptions the hard work really began Jenny and Eliza transferred their drawings to the lithographic stones right in the Jones's dining room using a pantograph which was a duplication instrument by which the movement of one pen would reproduce an identical movement and the second pen, and create an exact copy. 
Then the 65-pound lithographic stones were create, crated up and shipped 150 miles to Krebs Lithographic Company in Cincinnati to have test proofs made. And when imperfections were found in the drawings, the stones were returned to Circleville for correction. And this process was repeated several times before the first illustrations were satisfactory to everyone. Nelson, this is a Jones's house, the way, uh, Jones's office, the way it looks today. The medical offices were on the first floor. It, would began, it became Nelson and Howard's offices, and the family lived in spacious rooms above. Right now, it's divided into three separate stores. But the work in the house, it proved, was not a good place to do natural history illustration because the gas lighting didn't provide enough light and the clutter of nests was making the room look like a jungle. So Adam had a small, so Nelson had a small two-room addition added to the, stu, to the barn behind the house, and this became Jenny's studio. It was like her father's ark when he was in his college days. And then all the work on the book took place in Jenny's private studio. They mailed sample copies to leading ornithologists in the, in the country in December of 1878. And even though those, color, those samples were so slightly colored, it would have been impossible to imagine how they would really look in the finished version. The comments were remarkable. Elliot Cowes, the editor of the Bulletin of the Nettle Ornithology, Ornithology Club wrote, I had no idea that so sumptuous and elegant a publication was in preparation. And I'm pleased that what promises to be one of the great illustrated works on North American ornithology is going to be prepared by women. Eliza Schultz drew plate one, the Baltimore Orioles nest, similar to the nest Jenny found as a little girl while riding through the countryside with her father. William Brewster, the founder and president of the American Ornithologist Union wrote, the nest of the wood thrush is a perfect masterpiece. I find that my eyes dwell in it long and lovingly every time I open the work and glance through its pages. Please accept my grateful thanks for part one of your beautiful work and my best wishes for the future of a work that's too good to fail. Eliza Schultz, her drawing of the black-billed cuckoo's nest was the only illustration that drew some mildly negative criticism because of the artistic way she dangled the eggs from a thread. After that, all the other illustrations were done in a more business-like and scientific manner. Part one was mailed to subscribers in July of 1879, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. The number of subscribers increased from 20 to 39, and now included the name of ex-president Rutherford B. Hayes and Harvard College student Theodore Roosevelt. Although Genevieve seemed happily preoccupied with her creative venture, Howard said that following her romantic disappointment and the trip to Philadelphia, she was never her former self. She had grown silent and withdrawn and seemed to have lost much of her zest for living. On the rare occasion that the former suitor visited the Joneses' house, it was obvious to everyone that they still remained deeply hurt. And then just one month after part one was issued, and just as the future of the book project seemed so promising, Jenny was stricken with typhoid fever and was seriously ill for three weeks. During a lucid moment, she asked Howard to sit beside her on the bed. She took his hand in hers and told him that she knew she was dying. He told her what he believed to be true, that the worst of the fever was over. He had every reason to believe she was going to get well because in 1879, 80% of women who came down, of people who came down with typhoid fever did. But nothing he said could convince Jenny that she was going to get well. He tried to encourage her by asking her what would become of her book. And she said, if you want to, you and Lizzie finish the book just as if I'm alive. Mother will help you. And since it was obvious it was so hard for her to speak, Howard told her it would be all right to go to sleep. And the following day, she developed meningitis and died at the age of 32. Her family was immobilized by grief. 
Genevieve's former suitor became so overcome with sorrow and remorse that he committed suicide by taking an overdose of morphine. Howard wrote, he often wrote to, spoke to me about Genevieve and lamented her death. I always felt he felt somewhat to blame. Genevieve had only lived long enough to complete four of the illustrations for the work she'd been visualizing for most of her life. And these are her last illustrations. The nest of the Easter king, eastern kingbird, the nest of the indigo bunting, and the ne nest of the yellow warbler. No one knew what was going to become of the book project now. It was a Victorian tradition to stop the clock at the moment of a loved one's death. And this clock from the Joneses parlor stood silent for several weeks. But some decision had to be made. And finally her mother, Virginia, who had no interest in birds at all, and who had never drawn anything that required scientific accuracy before, decided she would take over Jenny's role in the book's production and would complete the work in her daughter's honor. When part two, already completed and assembled, was issued on time, Eliza tipped a note onto the first page that told readers of Jenny's death. Virginia had only intended to help with the hand coloring, but when Eliza announced that she wanted to withdraw to pursue formal artistic training, Virginia had no other choice than to take over all the book production by herself. Eliza sold her part of the copyright to Nelson and moved to New York City, where she built a successful career as an art teacher and a portrait painter. Before this time, Virginia had only used her artistic skills to make gifts for her loved ones. This is a book she filled with hand-colored, handwritten text and watercolor paintings that she copied from an existing copy of William Cullen Bryant's A Forest Hymn. Bryant's poem compares the man-made architecture of a cathedral with the architecture of a forest made by the creator. Enter the wild woods and view the haunts of nature. But you can see that the person who copied these drawings had not spent any time viewing the haunts of nature and probably would not have been comfortable in the wild woods at all. Virginia's interpretation of the forest just skims the surface of the landscape it doesn't convince you that she really sees or understands the structures or processes that are operating beneath. It was only after Jenny's death that Virginia began to contemplate the natural world that had been so meaningful to her husband and her children. Because that's what she was going to have to do if she had any hope of creating drawings as exacting as those that had been created before. Although her first attempts at lithography were tentative, somehow she managed to bring her drawing skills to the level of precision that had been established in the earlier part of the work. The transformation between the quality of the paintings in a forest hymn and Virginia's first illustration for her daughter's book, The Nest of the Loggerhead Shrike, is such a tangible example of the transformative power of love. It was impossible for Virginia to hand copy a hundred copies of all the illustrations. So they hired a, one of Jenny's friends, Nellie Jacob, to color the patterns on the eggs. And the Columbus artist, Josephine Clippart, the founder of the Ohio Watercolor Society, was hired to help Virginia color the nests themselves. And later they added a third colorist, a public school teacher who taught classes in oil painting. And now there were so many people involved in the book's production that the cost of its creation was exceeding the subscription price. But Nelson still believed that when the work was completed and had established a reputation, he'd be able to increase its price and sell a bound copy and recover some of his investment. Although the Jones's book was always revered because of its illustrations and really not for the text, it's still filled with little pieces, vignettes, into the lives of the family and their relationships with the birds. Howard wrote, one of the prettiest objects I've ever seen in bird life was a home containing five young Oreos. I decided to take two of them 
but the remaining ones would not stay in the nest. So I brought it along with me and hung it up in my room. At night, the little orphans would cuddle into the feather-lined basket and sleep quietly until dawn. They soon became very tame and grew rapidly on pounded beef and hard-boiled eggs. My sister Genevieve now took charge of them, placing them in a cage with a lot of other birds. They became so gentle and happy they would fly upon her finger at the door of the cage while perched upon and while perched upon one hand would catch flies imprisoned in the other. One was a male, who was always affectionate and good-humored, and liked to be played with, but would never permit anyone to stroke his feathers. Often he would amuse himself for hours by tying and untying a piece of string, working and singing at the same time. At the end of the second year, they had to be released because they became so noisy with their song that no one in the neighborhood could sleep after daylight. In 1875, a hummingbird flew into my room through an open window and was captured without injury in a butterfly net. A cage was constructed and the little fellow was imprisoned. After a week's confinement, he became so tame that at times the liberty of the room was given him. He knew his name and would come when called and perch upon my finger. One chilly winter day, I found him unable to sit upon his perch. He had rapidly been losing vitality since a period of migration had passed. I took him from the cage and placed him in the warm palm of my hand and procured some hothouse flowers for him. The little fellow, though too weak to stand, endeavored to probe the flowers for their insects and nectar. And when removed from my hand, he would crawl back with the most human expression of a broken heart I've ever seen in the bird. In this position, chosen by himself, my hand continued to warm the little body until it ceased to live. The amount of intelligence and feeling displayed by this little bird was really surprising, so much so that I resolved never again to rob one of that liberty which must be so dear and pleasant. Work on Jenny's book proceeded smoothly until 1881, when both Howard and Virginia were stricken with typhoid fever on the same day, and they were ill for several weeks. They did recover, but Howard had damage to his heart, and Virginia's eyes were permanently weakened. But still their labor continued. Virginia would still draw each new nest and eggs on a lithographic stone, and paint a master template from which the other artists worked. Howard was too weak to practice medicine for a year, but spent his better days driving into the countryside to gather nests and eggs. And during this time, he was not only trying to juggle a medical career with his part in the book's production, but had married and was raising a large family of his own. As Howard was working his way through the list of birds that nested in Ohio and came to less common birds, nests and eggs became harder and harder to find. He finally had to travel to Washington, D.C. to borrow specimens from the collection in Washington. And the reason there's only one little egg for the solitary sandpiper at the bottom is because the Smithsonian only had one egg in their collection from Ohio. Although Virginia's eyes were continuously painful from the effects of the typhoid fever and the long hours of straining to draw and hand paint the illustrations, she never gave up on her labor of love. After seven years of grueling work, the final installment of Jenny's book was issued in 1886. And to bring closure to their mourning, Nelson had Virginia's copy bound in two volumes in full Morocco by one of the best binderies in Chicago and this copy was sent to potential buyers as a sample. It tempted a few sales, but the country was in a state of economic recession, and few people could afford the luxury of a folio-sized book with hand-colored illustrations. Howard entered his mother's two-volume copy in the Women's Pavilion Library in the Columbian World's Fair in 1893 in Chicago, Illinois. It was awarded a bronze medal. All the medals were bronze. Jenny's dream of filling the gap in American ornithological literature was accomplished 
but the victory was bittersweet. When a librarian who was writing a review for the library journal inquired of Virginia how did she have the patience to complete it, Virginia responded, I did it in memory of my daughter. She had just begun the work when she died, and so for her sake, I made it as perfect as possible. The work Jenny initiated and her loving family brought to fruition broke new ground in the field of natural history illustration. When members of the American Ornithologists Union gathered on April 20th, 1917, to collectively celebrate the 70th birthdays of, memories of members who had been born in 1847, the names of seven individuals who were noted not to have lived long enough to reach the milestone, but had still left their names indelibly impressed on the records of ornithology. Miss Genevieve Estelle Jones was listed among them. Virginia lost her eyesight at the end of her life from the effects of typhoid fever and the long hours of straining to draw and color the nests. And Nelson lost his entire retirement savings completing Jenny's book. But neither parent were ever heard to complain. They both always said they were just thankful they had the resources to see the project through to its conclusion. And they considered their work on the book the most significant accomplishment of their lives. After Virginia and Nelson died, Howard locked the doors to the workroom in the barn, and they remained sealed for 32 years. All of the grandchildren who had grown up hearing about the illustrations of the nests and eggs of the birds of Ohio had built up a fierce curiosity about that secret workroom. The mystery became too much for grandson Nelson III and his friend Sam Chambers, who as 12-year-olds sawed the hinges off the door to gain entrance to the forbidden space. Nelson related to me in 1998 that at the time the feelings of excitement were intense, but they could not begin to compare with the intensity of the retribution that followed. Grandfather Howard always remained deeply sentimental about the period of time he'd spent with his family working on their book. And perhaps it was a grandson Nelson's intrusion into the barn that started Howard looking for a place for his mother's copy of the book so it could be preserved. The book and the bronze medal from the World's Fair were purchased by an unidentified woman in 1924 from Cleveland who promised to leave it to the Cleveland Public Library. Howard never learned her name and the book was never given to the Cleveland Public Library. But about 40 years later, it was donated to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History by the veterinarian from Chesterland but the bronze medal was not with it. Howard never stopped believing that the illustrations of the nests and eggs of the birds of Ohio would one day be considered priceless. His last act was to have his daughter and secretary prop him up into bed so he could sign over the ownership of the remaining copies to his daughter, Eleanor. All of the medals awarded at the fair were bronze. I'd always dreamed someday I would find Virginia's medal for sale on eBay or in some sales catalog. But that never happened, and I looked for about 20 years. And finally in 2016, there were three bronze medals for sale on eBay, and I spent proceeds from America's other Audubon for the one that was priced the lowest. And when, I, when it arrived and I turned it over to see who it had been awarded to, I read the name A.C. McQuirg and Company, which sounded familiar. A quick search of my manuscript of the new book I'm working on about the Jones family produced the reveal that Nelson had actually communicated with Mr. McQuirg in 1895 about selling the completed copies of Nests and Eggs, and their paths may have even crossed at the fair. McQuirg and Company was awarded a bronze medal for bound books of their own creation which were displayed in the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building, which was within walking distance of the Women's Pavilion Library, where Virginia's copy was on exhibit. On August 24, 2016, Wendy Wasman, the librarian at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and I put the medal in the case with Virginia's copy of Illustrations of the Nests and Eggs of the Birds of Ohio. And I can't help but feel that in that moment, 
somewhere, the spirits of Howard Nelson, Virginia, and Genevieve Jones were smiling. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You'd think by now I'd be over this. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> I put myself off mute, but okay. No, Joy, I don't think you'll ever be over that kind of just emotional connection you have to the family and how, what a beautiful story, way to end it, that you found the medal and that the medal is with the book. That That's just fantastic. I want to just thank you so much for doing this for us. It's just a wonderful thing. I can't wait to re listen to the recording again. And um, I think that Drina probably um, has a couple of questions for you. So I'm going to just let her uh, ask you those questions, Joy, if that's what you do. Thank you. Uh, first, I just would like to say thank you so much for everything that you did for this entire project. And um, I don't have specific questions formulated to ask you, but I was wondering if you would, um, if there's anything else you have to say. Well, um, what's one of the things that's been so special to me is that I got to know all the living relatives, all the grandchildren that were still alive, and listen to their oral histories, and they, they made me feel like part of the family. And when I worked in Washington, D.C., I couldn't come home for every holiday to see my family. And when the Jones, there were Joneses that were in D.C., one of the brothers, or the grandsons, I'm sorry. So anytime I, they found out I wasn't coming back to Ohio for a holiday, they they included me in their holiday. Oh, oh great. So, so I really felt like I gained a family, and it was so wonderful. Um, at the book launch in the Smithsonian, all all the Jones relatives were there, and my family was there on the computer, computer bus and on the train and told them about the story. The auditorium was filled and it was the first it was the first time they ever had a book talk where all the books were sold out. <laughs> wow. That's a pretty that is a that's a good story. That's really something, isn't it? But it is it is such a beautiful book. It's a, and I was lucky too. Let me tell you how the, if you have time, how the book came to be. Sure. Um, I always wanted to write a book about it, but I couldn't inter inter excuse me, interest a publisher. And the Smithsonian tried to interest publishers, too, in reproducing the artwork. But no, they went to New York. They took copies of the illustrations. No one would take it up. So one of the, uh, the older Jones descendants said, maybe we should have an exhibit in the Smithsonian. And we told them, you can't have an exhibit because the book is bound. All you can show is one illustration at a time. So we made a web exhibit. And they got to work on it with me. We, we put up some of the images, and they helped write the text in words so it could be posted on the Internet. And it was on there for about three years, and all of a sudden, I got an email from the curator of her books at the Smithsonian from a publisher who wanted to know if I wanted to give them a book proposal. <laughs> oh. So um, it was Princeton Architectural Press. How lucky could we be that it would be a press that would put so much love and attention into the detail of how this book was reproduced? It was just something that was meant to be, I think. It it does seem I it just seemed like it all just fell together like a jigsaw puzzle just like you know you were at the Natural History Museum in Cleveland and then you went to the Smithsonian and 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 then you uh, spoke in London and they said oh we have that book and it just it just all seemed 
to me, when I was reading your intro and, and the foreword from the gal from the Smithsonian, that it did. It just all seemed to fall in place. Like the Jones family wanted this to be put out there. And so, so wonderful that the descendants of them um, were so helpful to you. I, I have a question. I wonder <laughs> what's your what's your next book going to be? Do you do you have a next book or how do you how do you do a second one like this one? <laughs> well, the 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 one I've been working on really for like five years now is is a longer version. I gathered up thousands of copies of re of primary sources from the family, their letters and everything, they, they were so careful to preserve the history of how the book was put together. And so I tried to put together all that, all that history into a story. I, there's not enough material to write a story about Genevieve. That was my original thought, but the, there just wasn't enough of her writing or anything to know enough about her. All we know is what her effect had on the other people around her. But there was a lot of material about her father. So um, I'm, I wrote a book about the father's life and about the, the life of the book and how it affected everyone in the family. And oh. I, I traced, I tracked down 60, 89 books were completed. I tracked down 66. Wow. I was going to ask you that, how many books were completed. Um, how about talking a little bit, if you still have some time, about Jared Kirtland and Nelson. Um, I would think that that's the Kirtland of Kirtland Bird Club. I don't know a lot about him. I know that he um, was into breeding um, cherries. They called him the Cherry King because he developed so many Oh. 70, 76 kinds of cherries or something like that. He was quite a bit older than Nelson, so he he didn't live into the time period where the book was being produced. Okay. But um, he had a lasting influence on Nelson's life, and I feel like that influence was carried on into the children. It, it certainly seems like it was, that love of the outdoors and, and birds and birding and that does really seem like it. So, um, are you writing full time, or do you have other irons in the fire? I I still work. I work for United Way of uh, Summit County, and I answer the two one one calls for social service referrals. Oh, okay. we've been working at home since um, March, but I've I've since I started sometime in two thousand fifteen. 2015, getting up at 2 a.m. to work on writing, uh -huh. and uh -huh. but I, I'm having I'm not having as much success. Interesting, a, interesting a publisher in the story. They say it's too Ohio specific. Nobody outside of Ohio will be interested in it. But my but America's Other Audubon sold over 20,000 copies, so I don't see how they can say. There isn't an interest, and it was sold in other countries, not just here. Have you tried uh, Gray and Company? That Gray and Company, Dan Gray. Actually, yes, I did. And because he does a lot of Ohio-centric books, I did contact him, and he said no. Hmm. Interesting. But at this point, well, I would double back. Just. I I sent it to um, Kent State has it now. Oh. They they asked to have it. They asked for the whole manuscript to give it a a preliminary review. A once over. But that that's happened before and it didn't go anywhere. So. Well, I yeah. it will. As I'm alive, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way. That's a good thing. Well, I just think that it's been wonderful, Joy. Thank you so much, and thank you for not giving up on us with the technical problems, and it, it all worked out.
and uh, the recording, Betsy will do a wonderful recording of the thing, I am sure, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing how many people, you know, click in and, and listen to it, because it is, it is a good story. It is, yeah, and Ohio is, should be on the map. <laughs> so you are right. Um, thank you.